and welcome. Today's guest is a neuroscientist and clinical psychologist who has dedicated her life to advancing the treatment of trauma, grief, and stress-related disorders. She is the Global Director of Research and Curriculum Development for Havening Techniques and the CEO of Dr. Kate Truitt and Associates, the Trauma Counseling Center, and the Amy Research Foundation, which is a nonprofit focused on advancing the role of brain science in psychotherapy. In 2014, she founded Viva Excellence to provide cutting edge trainings and seminars that bring together the newest advancements in the fields of neuroscience, resiliency, stress, and trauma treatments. A renowned researcher, she is an expert on brain health during the recovery process, treatment outcomes, and psychophysiology. She's the author of the forthcoming books, Breathe and Healing in Your Hands, Harnessing Neuroplasticity to Heal the Past, Create the Present, and Build the Future. Please welcome Dr. Kate Truitt. Wow, you are a powerhouse. What a trailblazer and an industry leader. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here with us today. Well, and I could say the exact same about you, Ellie. So thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to have this experience with you today. You are amazing. So what inspired you to specialize in the treatment of traumatic stress and PTSD? You know, this go, we all have histories and the story of my own depression and anxiety certainly played a role in choices that I made now two decades ago. It's always incredible to think about how time flies. But two decades ago, when I was really coming face to face with my own depression and anxiety as a late teenager, young 20 something. And I remember sitting in a class on neuroscience and recognizing, wait a minute, we all have a brain. And, and, and that brain has a job and the job is to make sure we breathe, hence the name of the book. The job of the brain is to make sure we keep taking steps forward and we do the things that help us survive. And when I connected that, the other piece that I really linked into was, wait a minute, our brain's job is to keep us alive and everywhere we go, our brain goes. So what if what we're doing right now, the emotions, the cognitions, the thoughts and the feelings of this current moment are a part of how our brain learned to survive. And what if that could be changed? Mm. And that created a, a different doorway for me. And I had wonderful mentors along the way who invited me into a deep exploration of how the brain and the body work together to ensure we not just survive, but then move into a state of thrive. And so hence trauma and resilience, because mm -hmm. the resilience is about thriving and when we can lean into our trauma, as I know we've spoken about in the past, when we lean into the trauma and explore and develop an understanding of what happened, why it happened, yeah. we start to thrive because we grow stronger and wiser through what has occurred. Yeah, absolutely. That exploration. There's mm -hmm. something about when we understand, mm -hmm. when things make sense, that we can breathe. Yeah. Oh, now yeah. I get it. Now I understand. And the nervous system and everything. <sighs> exactly. Exactly. So, and and it, it allows shame or guilt or over functioning and all of that stuff to step back because it's like, oh, I'm doing that because I was taught that for survival. Yeah. And what if I can just be? Yeah. Yeah. What if I can just be? Yeah. Such a powerful question. Mm -hmm. Such a powerful question that really opens the doorway. So you've touched on the connection between neuroscience and trauma. But let's go a little deeper into oh, that. I love that. <laughs> so... For you, what does trauma mean? And what is the connection then? <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting as a, a neuroscientist and also a trained psychologist, because 
the two experiences don't necessarily line up in terms of what we're taught in graduate school and the educational trajectory. So from a neuroscience point of view, a stressful or traumatic experience will fundamentally shift the way our brain is making sense of the world. It links into core brain areas, particularly the thalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus, which then have downstream effects on the rest of the way our brain is making sense of the world. And as a psychologist, we're taught that trauma is post-traumatic stress disorder, which means it's what happens after the traumatic experience. And so one of the things that my teams and I work really hard to do is to reconcile those two experiences to create the thrive state and to recognize that every traumatic experience like we were just talking about has opportunity, possibilities and empowerment built into it. And that in of itself changes the neuroscience of the traumatic or stressful experience into one that the entire or the whole brain can start to make sense of which then links us back into our psychology of our thoughts and how are we narrating or making sense of the world. So it's a fine dance when we're looking at the idea of trauma and the descriptors or the story that we're putting to a traumatic experience. Because a traumatic experience left in puts us in a victim state, a traumatic experience transitioned into empowerment puts us in a survivor state, which then moves on to thrive. And so yeah, it, it's that, that perspective <laughs> is key, right? That perspective, that reframe that you're talking about, that that you and your teens are able to to help your patients and your clients achieve. I mean, what a gift that is to be able to help someone navigate from that trauma, that victim mm -hmm. state to the reframe into the survivor state and then to continue that journey into the thriver state to really reclaim their life and, and step into that. So it sounds like there is a really significant connection between neuroscience and mm -hmm. and then diving into or harnessing that, that power of that treatment approach to use the neuroscience based approach when you are helping people navigate from trauma to into thriving. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 150% because when we can say hard things happen and I can be stronger because of the hard things, the therapeutic process changes completely. It's no longer hard things happen and I'm defined by them. It's hard things happen. And what can I learn about me because of the hard things? And Ooh, the fact that we can that's now. A mic, that's a mic drop moment. So let's rewind. <laughs> Say that again for our audience, because that's so empowering and so important. Oh, goodness, Ali. Now you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's the differential. Hard, thing, hard things happen and I am defined by them versus hard things happen. And what can I learn about me and get curious about because the hard thing happened so that I am a stronger, wiser and more empowered person? Yeah. What can that, I learn about me? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, when a hard thing happens, we go into survival mode. Mm hmm. Our, our brain is designed to do that. It's designed first and foremost to make sure we keep breathing because if we're not breathing, nothing else matters. And so in those reactionary moments, whether it be because we're in the moment of the hard thing or our brain is returning to a hard experience because of some sort of present day stimuli and we're getting, as they say, triggered, mm -hmm. our brain is still going into a, Hey, I want to keep you alive state. Yeah. And, and, when we bring that into the therapeutic process, it changes our ability to connect and support our patients because survival, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. So why would we feel shameful about any reaction to a perceived threat that our brain is having in a moment? There's no purpose in, the, in shame there because our brain's like, high five, I'm keeping you alive, I'm doing the thing, woohoo. Yeah. I love that reframe because most people don't think about that to say mm -hmm. there's no shame 
in us surviving, in our brain doing exactly, exactly. what it is supposed to do. Yeah. So how amazing, what a gift that our brain did what it's supposed to do and kept us alive. What a gift that we're, that, that we're alive. And now we mm -hmm. get to learn from it. We get to grow from it. We get to, I, I just, I love that, that notion of there's no shame in survival. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you just brought in the get to like, that's the opportunity. We now get to go into the hard stuff. And what are we, what are we going to learn? Yeah. And, that, and that's such a uniquely human experience. As far as we know now, maybe there's other creatures out there that do this type of experience, but we don't know. And that curiosity in of itself is something that our brain is hardwired to link into. Our brain loves to feel like, hey, I can learn something. We're learning creatures. That's why we have a prefrontal cortex. And so linking that into the neurobiology of the therapeutic process changes the story completely. And it's so empowering because now it's like, oh, well, okay, as a patient, I had a hard day. I came home um, rather than meditating or doing some havening or taking a mindfulness walk. I poured myself a glass of wine or I drank a bottle of whiskey, whatever it might be. And instead of going, now I feel shame because I did an old coping mechanism that I'm trying to overcome. We can step back and go, why was that my easy button go to instead of the other thing? Hey, Amy, my amygdala, what was going on in that moment where there wasn't the space? So it's, there's no space for shame anymore. Instead, yeah. it's I get to learn about why I made a choice. Mm. And as children, that's what we're, again, going back to, that's what we're supposed to do as children is we're supposed to be empowered to learn how to make these types of choices. But for many of us, that's not an option that our brain gets because survival is about vigilance around our caregivers. Yeah. How do I ensure they're going to take care of me, keep me safe, love me? And that becomes my success button, which then leads to all of the other coping skills that may not work in our best favor. Yeah, I love that there's no space for shame. There's no space for yeah. guilt. And and I love your reframe on that because I think so many people default mm -hmm. when they're on a path of self-development, they're on a path of healing, they're on a path of growth, they're on a path of making new decisions or building a new career or whatever the new thing is. And yeah. when they slip up, in their mm -hmm. mind and they default to the easy button as as you so poignantly uh noted when they go back to those old paradigms the the very paradigms are the very coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that they are intentionally trying to shift yeah. then so often comes this slew of blame and shame and guilt and then the the failure and the, all that negative self-talk, that really hurtful, harmful self-talk where we beat ourselves up for defaulting to the easy button. So exactly. I love I love how you frame that. For someone who's newer in their journey and so defaulting to their easy button, uh, as, as you so uh, poignantly described, that becomes their go-to response, their go-to coping mechanism, their, their go-to action. And so often when someone is new in their journey and that's their default for something that they are actively and consciously trying to shift, mm -hmm. that starts a landslide of negative self-talk, of the, the blame and the guilt, and all of that talk of, see, I told you, you couldn't do it, you're a failure, and just kind of all of this, this very destructive um, downward mental spiral that uh, is not, it's not enjoyable or healthy. So how do you help someone in the middle of that downward spiral of negative self-talk? How do you help them stop the madness? Yeah. And I love that. How do we, how do we help them stop the madness? And 
you know, I think one of the most important things in all of that is that's so human. It doesn't matter how much we know about brains or therapy or psychology. That's a very human thing that we all do. And, and I'll be honest, it, I, I still do it to this day, even as somebody who specializes in this, because it is the brain ultimately going back to that idea of trying to keep us safe. So our default mode is those behaviors that we have learned help us survive and function day to day. And as we grow up, become adults, we have expectations and pressures. Those coping mechanisms may not serve us the way we want them to. And they can start to feel maddening, shameful, guilt inducing, crazy, so to speak. I, I know, and I, I know, Ellie, you know this, you know, I lived with uh, PTSD quite some time for myself and, and crazy was a litany that went through my head. Like, I am crazy. So the first step in creating space is that separation of this is me, my thinking brain, me as I know myself has this conscious, motivated drive to create a way of being. And my amygdala, who we lovingly call Amy, Amy the amygdala, who is a fierce maternal protector, steps in to ensure we stay alive, to ensure we keep breathing. And sometimes Amy responds and reacts to things in ways that do not align with me, what I really, really want. And that framework of this is my brain working diligently, desperately, because it can feel desperate when we're in the madness, desperately to keep me alive and separating that from, and I am on my healing recovery journey. So Amy's working hard. How do I turn towards Amy with love, acceptance, understanding, even compassion? How do I understand why she's working as hard as she is? Where she learned that she has to work this hard to escape or disconnect from this world? Because it is working hard when we do the easy button. It doesn't feel that way, but it is working hard because we are shifting the things away from what self wants. So how do we acknowledge that and connect into that? And that space between the two, Amy and self, starts to create a way to stop the madness and lean into empowerment. It brings curiosity and opportunity on board. I love that. I love the notion of having this dialogue, right? Having the grace, but also having the dialogue and the separation mm -hmm. and the literal separation of being able to understand, oh, that's Amy, my amygdala. And that's a, that's separate from, different from the conscious me that is choosing what I want yeah. my life to look like right now. It's, it's, the who am I, what do I want now versus, well, I've been alive and our brain's been wired like this for, you know, thousands of years. And it's, it's done a really good job of keeping me alive each and every moment of each and every day because mm -hmm. here I am. Amen. Yeah, that, that's an amazing reframe. I love the visual notion of separating them. And that separation allows the space. And I also think you said something that's really important that the audience can implement, and that's the curiosity, to approach it with curiosity. Mm -hmm. And that curiosity cre also creates space. It creates possibility. Yeah. It removes the, the, the blame and the guilt and, and shame and judgment and all the things because you're just being curious. Yeah. Well, and, and there's two cognitive paradigms that our brain is hardwired to do that we can actually harness for good, although they, in the therapeutic space, can feel like they get in their way. One is our brain is designed to have a negativity bias. We are hardwired to look for hard things. Now, in the 21st century, that doesn't feel like it serves us. Yeah. But if we contextually, to your point of millions of years, go back to the grasslands of I'm walking down a path and a bush starts shaking, we want a negativity bias because we want our brain to go, there could be a lion, tiger or bear in that 
bush, then that is designed to keep us alive. But in the 21st century, it's much trickier. But if we harness that negativity bias along with another bias called the confirmation bias, our brain loves to be right. Uh (sighs) Now in rumination, anxiety, and depression, what happens is our brain starts going, what if? What if the end of the world? What if this happens? What if they reject me? What if? And that's negativity bias and confirmation bias connecting. And then we actually, which is stunning, we get dopamine dumps. The more we think of hard things, our brain's going, you're right. That could happen too. And that could happen too. Oh, and that, oh, that, the the sky is definitely going to fall. Definitely. And And we're getting rewarded neurobiologically for all of those thoughts. And so instead, if we go, wait a minute, Amy, high five negativity bias, you are on alert for the shaking bush. Awesome. And guess what? Confirmation bias, we're safe. We start to balance the two out. We're honoring the brain's negativity bias, which is organic. And then we're harnessing the power of the confirmation bias to change and shift the way our brain is functioning and showing up. Yeah. It's so cool. It's It's really fun. So cool. High five, Amy. High five. You did the thing. You did the thing and I'm still alive. High five. So... We've talked about kind of how the brain responds during the trauma, and and we're starting to dive in a little bit on how the brain responds during the recovery process. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about the the brain's response when you are navigating through, when you are actually recovering. Yeah. So... As we're recovering, one of our main things that we want to be focusing on is, is exactly what we were just talking about, Ali. It's, it's harnessing the brain's natural capacity for neurogenesis, which is that there are certain parts of our brain that actually do continue to develop new cells across the course of our life. And the fact that our brain is neuroplastic, it's malleable, it's changeable. And that's what causes a lot of distress when we have trauma or stress. And that's also the biggest opportunity in the recovery process is to use neuroplasticity and neurogenesis with intention. And so when we're moving into the recovery process, we are gently healing through the traumatic experiences that our brain has encoded, as well as the schemas that have, and fr- a schema as a framework that have defined the narrative experience of how a person stays alive. And then we're creating new narrative experiences, new opportunities. And we do that through working with both the prefrontal cortex, the narrative understanding self in the world, and our primal brain, high-fiving Amy, strong work. And we're going to do this, letting her know that she's doing a great job and that we can stay safe in other ways. So recovery is a combination of what I like to think of as upstream and downstream effect, or I just flipped those, uh, upstream and downstream effects to create a new version of self in the world where we are empowered by every moment that has happened and led to this moment right here, right now. Mm where we're empowered by every moment that has happened that led us to this moment right here and right now. Yeah. So, so powerful. So let's talk about the technique that you use, Havening, and how that factors in to uh, your work and how it transforms a client's journey through recovery and building resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So havening is a newer neuroscience based modality kind of in the space of psychotherapy. And it grew out of tapping or EFT as well as EMDR as a psychosensory modality. The thing that's unique about havening is it harnesses positive or mindful touch to create electrochemical shifts in the brain and where it becomes a incredibly powerful tool 
is in the fact that positive touch, self-applied, has been shown to increase oxytocin, decrease blood pressure, increase heart rate variability, decrease cortisol across the board, and that even doing singular sessions of havening on acutely traumatic experiences or even distressing moments in the day-to-day -day life has sustained positive changes. And here's the thing, we, you know, we carry the capacity for touch in our own hands. And so it's really filling in a unique space in the psychotherapeutic community for being able to downregulate the system. And the other thing that it does, and it's the only modality that does this specifically, is it works directly with the amygdala. So the scientific term for the havening techniques is the amygdala depotentiation technique. And it's delinking these traumatic experiences or stressful experiences that have resulted in these less than preferable behaviors, easy button, I'm crazy, all of those harmful thoughts that we think are actually some, tied to something called stress-induced structural plasticity. And it's a type of neuroplasticity that's cortisol and norepinephrine driven that changes our brain. And havening is the only thing I've seen that directly interacts with that to delink those neural freeways. So we don't stay in that, oh, I'm just stupid. I'm so stupid. We can actually delink it and go, actually, Amy was doing a great job and strong work brain, you kept me alive. And what if I was actually pretty good at this? Or what if I was strong or whatever it might be? So we can use neuroplasticity with havening in a way that I've never seen before. And it's really exciting. It's a, it's a new tool on the market. I say that, we call it a tool. It's an integrative experience. Um, and it, it does really change the game for how we work with trauma and stress. Absolutely. And you mentioned that it's, it's applying self-touch and really you have your hands and so you're able to do it. And that ties in so beautifully with being able to bring this to people mm -hmm. anywhere in the world to allow them to heal themselves or to regulate themselves. So what a powerful, powerful tool. Can you uh, walk us through a, a short process or, or give us an example so that the audience can really see yeah. What does this look like? Absolutely. So two of my favorite regulating tools that, you know, I teach everywhere, I find it on our YouTube channel, on the TikTok channel, are the CPR for the amygdala, which stands for Creating Personal Resilience for the Amygdala, and the Creating Possibilities Protocol, which originally came out of my EMDR work all the way back in the mid 2000s, but I've since tailored to align with the neuroplastic opportunities of havening. So CPR for the amygdala is all about wrapping bubble wrap around Amy when she's having a hard time, when she's feeling reactive and struggling to connect into the space to create a different choice. The nice thing and the exciting thing about CPR for the amygdala is that when we're in a moment of emotional reactivity and we use CPR for the amygdala, we're actually creating a electrochemical experience in our brain that will soften whatever's become triggered or active in that moment and make it less likely to show up again in our future. That's part of creating the present and building the future. So first let's step back to the, the mechanism of havening is the havening touch, which has four different specific motions. So one is palm on palm. So the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was washing their hands and singing songs, as you'll see in just a moment, Ellie, they were actually doing palm havening and CPR for the amygdala. So this is one motion and this engages little fibers in our skin this is the second motion I call this a havening hug. It's just kind of a gentle, slow movement. And so you're giving yourself a nice hug, but it's moving because we want to, again, engage specific receptors in our skin. And then finally, the last two movements are across the brow. If you've ever had a stress headache, then you might be familiar with this motion. And right under the eyes, circling around the cheekbones. 
the havening touches, these four motions, engage mechanoreceptors in our skin that create a slower brain wave state in our brain. So it actually enhances the power or the presence of a slow brain wave state. There's two, one called theta and one called delta. When we're in a moment of agitation or anxiety or reactivity, it can feel like our brain's going really fast. That's a gamma or a hyper gamma wave. And we're literally creating the opposite wave through using these touches. Then we want to a CPR for the amygdala, make sure that Amy can't start building those negativity bias, confirmation bias stories. We're changing her narrative by giving her a different job. And one of the easiest versions of giving her a different job is counting breath. As we know, breathing is one of Amy's core jobs. Keep breathing. We got you. And so we'll do, we'll invite clients to breathe into a count of four and exhale to a count of six and apply the havening touch while they're counting the numbers as they breathe in and as they exhale. And on our YouTube channel, we have a whole bunch of guided exercises for this. The idea is we want to make sure that we're intentionally giving our thinking brain a new job to distract Amy from building her own fearful narratives and stories and oxygenating the brain and the body since Amy wants to make sure we keep breathing is a beautiful hack for that. So we're letting our body know, oh, I have oxygen, I'm okay. While calming the brain down into a, oh, I can be grounded and I'm okay. So just as breath work regulates the heart, CPR for the amygdala regulates the brain and the heart. That is such a powerful technique and it is definitely something that anyone can do. The, yeah. the four touch movements, we all know how to wash our hands, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know how to give ourselves a hug and anyone who has had a stress headache or a tension headache, or has had sinus, <laughs> sinus or, yeah, right? Uh, we yeah. are familiar with those movements. So how empowering that we're already equipped with do it. the tools that we need. Yeah, and that it's it's the touch and it's the breathing, both of which we know how to, how to do. So, so empowering. I love that you shared that with us. And you've mentioned your YouTube channel. And so I want to make sure that we are providing everyone with the, uh, the direction of where they can go to watch these tutorials, to watch the guided meditations, to learn these techniques that you are sharing. So where can they go to find that? So our YouTube channel is Dr. Kate Truett. And then we recently started a TikTok channel um, back in October, which has kind of taken off, which has been really exciting. And the entire premise of the TikTok channel is to put knowledge into people's hands. And so that is a space where anybody can come in and ask a question. And then once a day, I respond to a question through a video format which then also helps guide the content on the YouTube channel, which releases a psychoeducational video one a week, as well as a guided therapeutic exercise on every Sunday. And so they, the entire, it's, yeah, it's so much fun. And the entire premise is how do we quite literally put healing into people's hands? Because and, and part of, it's, it's a very personal mission. I reflect on myself as a child uh, growing up in the 80s and therapy just wasn't a thing, especially in the Midwest and how, wow, my life would have been different. I wouldn't change anything about my life. I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't had the moments I had. And what if we can give access and knowledge and share this so that people know that they literally have the capacity to create and build the world they want to live in and become empowered by what they've been through. 
I love that. And I love that you are putting it on TikTok and YouTube, that these are free resources that are available to anyone with internet. So no matter where you are or what your financial situation is or um, what your life circumstances are, right there on your cell phone, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you have the ability to go and watch the videos, to haven along with the videos, to, mm -hmm. to have these guided exercises. So literally there is an entire treatment universe of all of your videos that yeah. are out and free and available and accessible to all that's incredible yep. that's that's the mission <laughs> let's put ourselves out of business <laughs> you don't find too many people that say let's put ourselves out of business i love that i love that this is truly your mission and your purpose and that you step into it fully and heed the call and stay aligned now earlier you mentioned that newsflash you're human <laughs> you have uh, you yourself can can have moments right of of yeah. fear or doubt or um, overwhelm or the imposter syndrome or whatever the case may be right we Absolutely. we all have moments in this human journey that we're on and you mentioned that that you use havening on yourself what else do you do to mm -hmm. uh to get yourself out of those brief moments of fear or shame or guilt or self-doubt or judgment and back into alignment. Oh, there's so many things. There's so many moments. <laughs> Hence, how, yeah, newsflash being human. You know, some of the, the quicker hacks that I really love, and Andrew Huberman has really brought forward this idea of a side breath which is a very simple breathing exercise that has been shown to done regulate the heart very rapidly. And I always wrap the havening touch around everything. Um, but even doing the side breath practice without the havening touch is very powerful. And what that looks like is a single inhale. And then before we exhale, we inhale again on top of the initial inhale and then do a slow, gentle exhale. And what the research has shown is that doing that breathing pattern for just one minute calms the heart rate exponentially, which again, invites our thinking brain back online. And so I, I use that as another distraction technique in any moment of reactivity. Um, I do a lot of self-awareness, compassion work. And then the other thing, uh, the other protocol I mentioned earlier, which is that creating possibilities protocol is harnessing the opportunity for curiosity, the confirmation bias, and literally doing a Google search of how can I feel differently in any given moment? And I probably do this 60 times a day, where if I'm noticing I'm getting pulled by a fictitious tiger in a bush, maybe an email that came in or a text message or whatever it might be, I lean into how would I like to or prefer to respond to this stimuli? And then I inquire, what if I was in that preferred feeling state? And I always welcome that in with the havening touch and I say it five times. And then the protocol itself goes from what if I was to can I be? So a deepening exploration of can I be in this feeling state with this message, which invites Amy to share any concerns or hesitations she has, because sometimes we do get stimuli that does have a threat or a stress element to it. And we go, Amy, can we feel this way? And as we explore that, can I be, she will pop up with any concerns or worries. And then we can move into in the next five seconds, will I be? And again, deepening the curiosity with Amy. So you're hearing the building of the relationship between self and Amy. And then finally moving into, oh, actually I am 
whatever my preferred feeling state is before I'd move into action. And for those of us who have, you know, slightly more reactive brains, and I would say, especially living in the stress of the pandemic, 2020 to 2022 now, a lot of our nervous systems have what we call a smaller window of tolerance. And the creating possibilities protocol is a very easy way to capture a natural bias that are or two natural biases, like we talked about earlier, LA, that our brain does, and then apply the havening touch the, to neurobiologically build new neural freeways with intention and deepen our relationship with Amy. And the more we do that, this is the really exciting part, the more our brain learns to do that organically so that it becomes an immediate checkpoint when a stressful stimulus arises. And same thing with CPR for the amygdala. The more we practice CPR for the amygdala, the more our brain learns, hey, I'm going to breathe when I'm noticing reactivity and then I'm going to inquire. Well, what if? How can I be differently? Can I be different? Can I do something else which creates choice? I love those four questions. It's it's a progression of four simple questions. Yeah. Again, that's something that anyone can do. Anyone can walk through this process of simply asking themselves four simple questions. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's incredibly powerful and so accessible. Now, we've talked a lot about ways that we can navigate when we've been triggered or through our healing process. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the, the importance of self-care so mm -hmm. that you have the reserves within you to, you have a nice full cup and you are able to make the choices, able to be present, able to really step into the creation mode instead of just reactive mode. Yeah. So what is your self-care practice? Oh, good question. <laughs> I, um, you know, I'm very lucky to live my purpose, but the, the downside of that is there's very blurry boundaries and maybe you could relate to this yes. between yeah who me purpose and then when am I working and when am I taking the space for myself? Um, but my, my self-care practice is highly defined by a couple of critical factors. Uh, one of the things that we teach all of our patients is a resilient brain care program. And I do use this program in my day-to-day -day life every day. And it is so empowering because it enhances my awareness of who I am and why my amygdala is doing wackadoodle things because my Amy can be wacky. And how do I choose to harness the wacky and turn it into something that's useful and utilitarian? So in the morning, it's a simple wake up. I wake up same time every single day to the best of my ability. The time change recently has been a little tricky. Um, but waking up and asking myself, how do I feel as I wake up? Because Amy doesn't sleep as we sleep. She processes. And so if there's disturbed sleep or nightmares, that will show up and carry through into our day. And so if we wake up on the wrong side of the bed, that's actually neurobiologically factual, that's real. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to do a scale of zero to 10. Zero is like, I feel ready to conquer the day. And 10 is, oh, this is a bad day. This is not gonna be good. And if I'm above a two on that scale, then I do that CPR for the amygdala. I help my brain calm down. I oxygenate, I do my breath work. And I always drink water because we all naturally wake up dehydrated. So big glass, eight ounces, first thing in the morning, you'll be amazed at the impact of that. It's so positive before the coffee, preferably, yeah. which is also good. And then I ask myself, what energy do I need for today? And it might be, I need to be grounded. I mean, I need to be energized. Um, I need to be inquisitive or curious, depending on the requests of the day. And then I do that creating possibilities. How do I bring that energy forward? What does it look like to embody that? 
And then anytime throughout the day, if I notice my mental state shifting, I because I've anchored that creating possibilities protocol, and you can find the whole protocol on our YouTube channel, because I've anchored that, our, our brain holds on to learning for many, many hours. Mm-hmm. We can just circle back and go, oh, I remember what that felt like this morning and bring it back, building that neural pathway. And then at the end of the day, we do a review. How was the day? Is there any stress that's continuing to linger? Anything that might impact my sleep? If there is, check in a little bit more CPR for the amygdala. Let Amy know she can let it go. And then transitioning into the night. How do I want to feel tonight? Is this a date night or is this a relaxation night? Is my amygdala going, that was a really hard day and I want to push the easy button night. Oh, do, is this an easy button night or is this a, hey, let's work on building the new easy button if we're still new in the journey or if things are really hard because when things are really hard, we go back to default mode, whatever that might be. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's always leaning in. And also holding space for the fact that my brain's had a journey and loving my brain for the fact that I'm here breathing right now. And so if I have a reaction, if I have agitation, if I have a human moment, which we all have going, okay, well, my brain's made it to this point. That's okay. And how do I love my brain so that we can continue doing the things that really matter and being the person that I want to be? Powerful self-care practices. And so it takes literally seven minutes a day. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's, seven that's minutes a day. Seven and minutes can, a day. Yeah. And you can fly through all of that. Your yeah. check-in process, you know, walking through the things that you've shared. Mm-hmm. Seven minutes a day. We all have that. Seven minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you have a couple of books coming out. We talked a little bit, uh, just touched on Breathe. Let's talk a little bit about healing in your hands. Tell us more about that. Basically, Ellie, everything that we've been talking about. It's a book that will guide the reader through a personal experience of moving into deep intentional relationship with Amy of really understanding how their unique amygdala has worked across the course of their life to keep them safe and help them survive and to Phoenix up, so to speak. How can they harness the empowerment from all of these old experiences that have happened in the past and bring them forward in a new way that serves who they want to be today? And it is designed in many respects to be a companion book to breathe, which is my own personal story of trauma to resiliency. And the two work symbiotically hand in hand of here's how we understand our brain and and the, the wackadoodle things that brains do. And here's how we learn to love ourselves and our brain with intention. Mm, I love that. So your journey has not been an easy one. Uh, it's coming out in, in the book, Breathe, and, and we've alluded to it. Um, and we've talked a lot about some uh, creating space and high-fiving Amy and breathing and, and some grace. How important is forgiveness? Yeah, I think forgiveness is, I, I love this question on so many levels. Um, forgiveness is one of these really tricky human experiences One of the ways Amy can struggle with forgiveness is this experience of if I forgive, does it mean that I have forgotten the thing that caused pain or hurt me? And that can become a major roadblock and barrier in the recovery journey, whether it be forgiveness of self, because sometimes we do need to dig in and go deep and forgive ourselves for things that have happened, choices that were made based on survival or forgiveness of somebody else who has hurt us and resentments that we're still chewing on. And so unpacking forgiveness is critical because we can forgive and let Amy know that we can still keep her safe. And that's self. Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiving means creating space for learning and being back in our own power. 
I love that. Forgiveness allows you to come back to your own power. It creates a space for learning and allows you to come back to your own power. That is such a powerful reframe and an empowering perspective that Mm -hmm. I think so many of us can can really lean into Mm -hmm. and and receive. And need. Yeah. Yeah. So let's imagine that you are coming to the end of your life best lived. You have put yourself out of business. <laughs> Everyone in the world is equipped to uh, I wish yeah. themselves. You have left it all on the table. You have done everything you came here to do. And it has been a beautiful life. What do you want them to say about you? That's a big question. I don't know if it's what I want them to say about me. I think it's more about, and, and this might sound like I'm waxing, I'm making this up, but it's, but it's true. It's look how different the world is. And I, I feel like I'm very blessed to be a part of a, a larger journey that I've been invited into through the, the humans, yourself included, that I have met along this way. And I'm, I'm, I'm just bringing one small voice and opportunity for personal empowerment and healing. And at the end of the day, if we, that mission is accomplished, then it's, it's, it's me standing on the shoulder of giants with other giants standing alongside me going, we did it. (laughs) High five. We did it. High five. We did the thing. And that's it. That's what it boils down to is, you know, we did, I mean, it's, it's so much of this is shareware and I mean, that's, that. it's kind of going back to the old grasslands model of humanity of we are a village. Our brain is not designed to work in a village of billions of people, but here we are. And so what can we do to create common connection points amongst all humans? Because we all have very similar brains so that there is a way to link back to the village and help each other out. And if I've done that, I've done, I've done the thing. That, 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 that's my thing. And so I guess people would be saying, she did the thing. I'd be like, yes, we did. <laughs> cool. They'll, they'll be turning to each other. High five. She did the thing. Yeah. We did the, <laughs> and we all did it too. Yeah. Um, pretty, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. So we, uh, we talked a little bit about how people can find your videos on, on your YouTube and your TikTok. How else can people get in contact with you? How can they find you? How can they learn more about the work that you do and about Amy Foundation and just all the things? All the things. Um, so obviously we have our, our website, um, drtruitt.com is my clinical team. We're based in California. And so we do provide services throughout California. Um, so going to that website, we release monthly blogs on there, um, highlight different uh, psychoeducational components that enhance the work on the YouTube channel. Uh, additionally, we have an Instagram account where it's more psychoeducationally based, traditional Instagram. Um, I, I do, I, I partner with Echo, which is a wonderful nonprofit out here in California to provide self-healing workshops several times a year. They're virtual, so they can be attended anywhere and they're for both the community as well as for clinicians to learn the foundations of havening, uh, especially the self-havening components. And so that's a, if you go to, I think it's echo dot, echotraining.org. And the proceeds of that training goes to helping families in need who are struggling with difficulties within the family systems in order to help families raise up and stay together. It's a really beautiful, powerful organization. I'm very honored to work with them. So I highly recommend checking out those workshops. And then if clinicians want to learn more, if we have healers on the um, 
in our audience, uh, you can go to pessy.org um, or pessy.org forward slash havening. I just did a one day workshop with them or we have a bunch of advanced trainings where you, you get to get into the really nitty gritty clinical, powerful side of havening on how to integrate this into clinical care and really enhance the work that you're doing with your patients. It's a great bolt on to all traditional psychotherapy models because we're just saying, here's neuroscience. Yeah. Let's use that to enhance the work you're already doing. And I think those are the primary ways. And then we have all the shareware on YouTube and TikTok and the books coming out. <laughs> so many ways, all of which are impactful. So everything that you're doing, whether it's the shareware on YouTube and TikTok, whether it's the seminars and the workshops that you are teaching for patients and also for practitioners, um, the more, the deeper dives for the practitioners and the healers out there for the work that you do with the various nonprofits, with your own nonprofit that you so brilliantly helm. Uh, all the things, beautiful and impeccable, and run out and connect uh, with her. Take advantage of this. There are very few experts who give you all of this content for free, who give you the videos, who teach you how to heal yourself yeah. for free. So this is an invaluable resource. Definitely check it out. Spread the word and um, yeah, be able to heal yourself. I love this. I love this. So Dr. Kate, before we sign off today, um, do you have any parting words or anything you would like to share with the audience? I think the, the takeaway is when our brain does things and then we feel feel shame or self-judgment. We criticize ourselves. Remember that the thing that's leading to those less than preferable feelings, that the thing that happened was really your brain doing its best to love you in the way it was taught. Our brain is always trying to serve us. Amy is always trying to serve us. And honor that and love that. High five it. Because as soon as we go, got it, high five, then immediately space opens up and we can shift. And, and that's the hub of it all. High five, Amy. High five. You're doing awesome. You're doing, You're doing the thing. thing. You're doing the thing. And now let's learn how to do something else. But thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, I know you are exceptionally busy and uh, I am honored and grateful that you are here sharing these resources with us, sharing these tools with us, sharing your wisdom and your expertise with us and sharing your life, your mission, your purpose, and your legacy with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, right back at you. Thank you. Till next time. Yes.